All right, let's do our sound check. Uh, Deputy Secretary Fahrenbach, can we hear you? Good afternoon. All right, sounds great, thank you. All right, let's continue with our sound check. Dr. Lindquist, can we hear you? All right, Dr. Lindquist. Oh, there it is. Sorry, it just took a while to unmute. Excellent, thank you so much. And Paj, can we hear you? Paj, are we able to hear you? All right, we'll circle back. We have a couple a uh, small technical uh, issue. So we'll circle back. Hold on just one moment. Michelle, can we hear you? I'm here. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you so much. Hi, Paj. We've got video. Do we have sound? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, great. Hold for just one more moment while we uh, get all of our panelists on board. Good morning, Dr. Shaw. We have no audio for you. For, excuse me, no audio from you yet. Hold on, I might be able to find you. All right, one moment. All right, Dr. Shaw, can we hear you? Yes, there you go. Can you hear me now? We can. Thank you. All right, I think we've got everyone here. I will uh, share our title slide, just one moment. All right, we're gonna pause for just a few, minutes, a few seconds to get our live stream going on TVW and then we'll begin. Good afternoon and welcome to the Thursday, February 4th COVID-19 response media briefing. I'm Frangie Mays, your facilitator for this event. I'd like to welcome our panel for today. We have Dr. Umer A. Shaw, Secretary of Health for the Washington State Department of Health. We have Michelle Roberts, Acting Assistant Secretary for the Department of Health. We have Paj Nandi, Director of Community Relations and Equity with the Department of Health and Dr. Scott Lindquist, State Epidemiologist for Communicable Diseases with the Department of Health, and Lacey Fahrenbach, Deputy Secretary for the COVID-19 Response for the Washington State Department of Health. 
Well, to begin today's briefing, we'll open with remarks from Secretary Umer Shah. Great, thank you. Thank you, Frangie, for, for, for uh, kicking us off and apologies to everybody for a few technical issues. I, I was having some trouble on my end as well, so just apologies for that. Uh, good morning and thank you everybody for joining us. I wanna thank uh, particularly all of you and our community members. I also wanna thank uh, my fellow panelists, uh, DOH colleagues uh, with, as you heard, uh, Michelle Roberts, uh, Lacey Farenbach and Paj Nandi, as well as Dr. Scott Lindquist, who is uh, available for questions as well. I wanna just say uh, this week, our state uh, uh, passed uh, 300,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 uh, in the state of Washington. And as of February 2nd, unfortunately, we've also had 4,388 deaths from COVID-19. While these are sobering numbers, and they are, as we get further past the holidays, we are seeing some progress in the right direction. And that's hopeful news for all of us. This week, as you know, two regions, the Puget Sound and West regions, were able to move into phase two of the governor's roadmap to recovery. While this is welcome news and we're hopeful that other regions will also be able to move into uh, phase two soon or sooner than later. However, we have to remember that we are far from out of the woods. COVID-19 activity is still high in our state. And we've now confirmed, unfortunately, several cases of uh, the variant that spreads more easily and quickly in our state, and this should give all of us pause. Now is the moment for all of us to drive down uh, disease rates, and we want to do everything we can to free up hospital capacity before the variant takes hold. And this absolutely underscores the importance of vaccinations, and that is something that all of us uh, at Department of Health and our partners are focused on. This means that all of our community members need to and, and, and should help all of us work together in keeping up our efforts. I know we're tired of this virus, but again, it's not tired of us. Please practice the three W's of wearing a mask, washing your hands, watching your distance, and certainly getting tested. These are absolutely critical to the efforts that we have in place from a public health system. While we must remain cautious, we're also seeing a great deal of progress, again, as I mentioned, and signs of hope in our response efforts. We continue to work with the new Biden administration, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC in particular, on ways to strengthen uh, our state's response in coordination with other states across the country. We appreciate the ongoing communication and support from our federal partners. And we're also improving every day our state's vaccine response capacity. Every day, as you know, we have set a goal of vaccinating 45,000 um, uh, vaccines in the arms of Washington uh, community members. And that means that we have a lot of work to do, but we are making progress and we've made impressive movement toward this goal uh, each and every day. Providers in our state have given over 773,000 doses total, and we are now averaging almost 28,000 vaccine doses given each day. And that's more than three times our daily average at the start of 2021. So we've made tremendous progress, but we all know that we have a lot of work still ahead. While the demand for vaccines still outstrips the supply coming from the federal government by far, we are steadily improving these numbers as our allocations increase. We are also working to ensure the doses we do have get into their arms as quickly as possible. Providers in our state, we have to be so appreciative of their efforts. Thank you to them and to all of you for helping getting this, this, this Herculean task off the ground and moving in the right direction. We've given over 66% of the vaccine doses delivered to um, our state is now uh, in the arms of Washingtonians and that percentage continues to rise. I'm also very pleased to see that our Vaccine Action Command and Control System Center, the VAX, V-A-C-C-S Center, has begun work in public-private partnerships to support mass vaccination efforts. The CEN center was created to harness uh, public-private partnership and harness the power of private sector resources to help the state reach our goal of 45,000 vaccinations per day. And partners are providing these resources pro bono to support fast, efficient, and, and effective 
increases in throughput, and we certainly want to make sure that's complementary to our equitable goals as well. For example, last week, along with Governor Inslee, I visited the state's mass vaccination site in Clark County, where we are partnering with Safeway as a registered vaccine provider. That partnership has been critical to the site's success, and we look forward to seeing what we can accomplish with other efforts through the center. Another example of that at, uh, in, at the mass vaccination site was the arrival of Starbucks to really help us with our throughput and really effectiveness and efficiencies. I'm also encouraged to see providers acting quickly to ensure that no vaccine uh, goes to waste in our state. We know last week, Swedish Medical Center and the University of Washington worked with Kaiser Permanente to ensure more than 1,600 doses of vaccine were not wasted after an overnight equipment failure. This is a great example of the incredible work that's happening around the clock across our state to keep people safe and get shots in the arms of Washington residents. In this light, we're all dismayed to hear reports of invitation-only vaccine clinics. And I wanna be very clear, the Department of Health does not condone this behavior and we have never allowed it. This kind of practice disregards our prioritization of people who are at most risk and disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. It is inequitable, it is wrong, and it must stop. Facilities or organizations doing these kinds of activities certainly risk not receiving additional shipments of vaccine, and we want to make that very clear. Equity remains the primary focus of our state's vaccination distribution efforts, and we are continuing the dialogue over the next several months. And Paj Nandi is going to be speaking about this, but we uh, just yesterday had the first convening of our COVID-19 vaccine implementation collaborative and these set of dialogues, what I call the VIX, uh, along with the VAX, with the Vaccine Action Court Command and Control Center, will really very much work to ensure equitable and accessible vaccine outreach, education, and engagement, as well as implementation of our strategies. The work of the VAX and the VIX uh, is key for both throughput, but also equity. I'm proud of this complementary work that is happening and really underscores the importance of both of these eff efforts, both in terms of quantity and speed and throughput with the VAX, as well as with the collaborative, the, the key uh, work of dialogue feedback, feedback and, and equity with our partners. And we wanna thank our team and our partners as they help in these efforts. Truly it is, uh, we are all in this together. So let me close by just saying I'm incredibly thankful of the efforts we're seeing across the state to get people vaccinated from small clinics to mass vaccination sites, from, from rural areas to urban areas, uh, small and large and, and everything in between. We're doing everything we can to increase the numbers as quickly as we can. And we continue to work with our federal partners to increase the number of allotment of vaccines into our state, and that is an important piece for us as well. We have so many partners, local health jurisdictions, providers, healthcare workers, community organizations, and so many more than I can even enumerate here. They are doing incredible work despite amazing amount of significant challenges and the concern around limited supply. And so I wanna thank all of them. I wanna really express my gratitude as Secretary of Health, but also the gratitude of all of us in state government for the incredible work on the ground that's happening within the state of Washington. Thank you. There's still a lot of work yet to be done, but I'm encouraged by the strides we are making as a state and we will continue to make these strides and continue to be effective in our mission to protect as much as possible everyone in the state of Washington, but especially those who have been disproportionately impacted by by this horrific pandemic that we've had that we have been all fighting throughout this last year. So with that, I want to say thank you. And I'm going to now turn it back over to Frangie. Thank you, Secretary Shaw. Next, we'll go to Assistant Secretary Michelle Roberts. Good morning, everybody. I'm Michelle Roberts, and I lead the COVID-19 vaccine planning and distribution team for the Department of Health. Today, I'm going to share some information and signs, um, shine some light on allocations, why we're expanding where people can get their COVID-19 vaccine, and how we're making the tough decisions about where vaccine goes each week. 
I first want to talk a little bit more about numbers. Our COVID-19 dashboard was updated yesterday. And as um, Dr. Shaw shared, as of February 1st, over 770,000 people in our state have received the COVID-19 vaccine. Across the state, we've administered about 67% of the million doses delivered to providers and long-term care programs in our state. We've significantly sped up vaccination in our state. Our seven day va average of vaccine given each day is currently at 28,000 doses. Two weeks ago, that number was around 14,000. This is proof we're getting closer to our goal of vaccinating 45,000 people per day. One of the reasons the numbers continue to rise is because of the success of our mass vaccination sites. Since opening on January 26, more than 15,800 people have gotten their shot at one of the state's four sites in Spokane, Ridgefield, Wenatchee, and Kennewick. I wanna thank my fellow workers at the Department of Health, as well as the Washington National Guard and our local and private sector partners. Thanks to you, we've gotten thousands of shots into arms in a short period of time at our new mass vaccination sites. The increase is encouraging. However, the problem we're still running into is that the demand for vaccine is outpacing the number of doses we're getting from the federal government. We know providers want more doses of vaccine and the public is anxious to be vaccinated. This week, we received more than 358,000 requests um, for first doses of vaccine from 612 healthcare facilities. To put that into perspective, we have more than 1,000 enrolled facilities across the state. But our first dose allocation from the federal government for this week was just over 107,000 doses, which is less than one third of what providers asked for. On top of that, our second dose allocation was also less than what providers asked for. This week, we were given um, almost 59,000 second doses of vaccine, and it's about 15,000 fewer dose second doses than what our provider facilities wanted. Over the past couple of weeks, we've expanded our vaccine allocation beyond hospitals to help with access. Early on, it made sense to send most of the vaccine to hospitals. That's how we reach the most at-risk um, workers in healthcare settings and how we also maintain the capacity in our healthcare system. Now, we need to spread our limited vaccine supply to more sites across the state to help people have easier access to vaccine. That means it's important that pharmacies, community health centers, local public health, and mass vaccination, vac vaccination sites also receive weekly allocations. Which brings me to the very important topic of deciding who gets vaccine each week. With limited vaccine supply, this is not an easy choice. This week, we allocated about 19% of the vaccine to community health centers, 23% of the vaccine to hospitals, 35% of the vaccine to mass vaccination sites, that includes the four sites um, that the state is running, and also the three sites in Pierce, King, and Snohomish. Uh, we also gave about 19% of the vaccine to pharmacies and about 3% of the vaccine to tribes and urban Indian health programs. I wanna explain more about how these decisions are made. Each week, we distribute vaccine to enrolled providers through a multiple step process. It begins Saturday and must be done by Thursday to meet um, by Thursday night to meet the CDC's Friday morning ordering deadline. Our enrolled providers place their requests in the state's immunization information system. We also gather information from local health jurisdictions to help decide where vaccines should go based on um, needs in their communities. These tough decisions are then made using those two pieces of input, but also several other factors including the number of people eligible in each county, data from our providers, like what types of refrigeration equipment do they have, who are they serving, equity considerations, um, including who are they serving, who's most at risk, do we have equity and distribution across the state? Again, ensuring that there's access to all provider types again, which is hospitals, pharmacies, mass vaccination sites, clinics as well as the provider's current inventory and documented throughput, which brings me to my next topic. Unfortunately, we have had to reduce vaccine orders because some providers are not meeting the state's 95% rule. This is a requirement Governor Inslee announced last month when we expanded vaccine eligibility across the state. 
This means providers administering vaccine must use at least 95 95% of their allocations within a week. This week, we had to reduce orders for 39 providers because they still had more than 5% of vaccine left over from the previous week. I want to th end by thanking the public for their patience. We know waiting isn't easy. We know we're all tired of the pandemic and wish we could be vaccinated. As allocation numbers from the federal um, government increase, we will continue to work hard to make sure our vaccine numbers go up as well. And we promise your turn is coming. Thank you. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Roberts. And now we'll go to Director, excuse me, Director of Equity at DOH, Paj Nandi. Good morning, everyone. My name is Paj Nandi, and I serve as the Director of Community Relations and Equity at the Department of Health. And as part of our commitment to lead with equity and engage communities during the COVID-19 vaccine rollout, I'm pleased to highlight one of six key strategies today, uh, which is really regarding fostering opportunities for collaboration. As Secretary Shah mentioned, just yesterday, we launched our very first COVID-19 vaccine implementation collaborative. And this is a virtual space to ensure that equity and social justice in vaccine planning and implementation is uh, front and center. And it will be initially focused on access and outreach as those are really critical issues at this stage. We know that COVID-19 has impacted everyone, but it has not impacted everyone equally. Our BIPOC and other historically marginalized communities have been hit hardest, and the pandemic has exacerbated health and other inequities that have long existed due to systemic racism and other forms of oppression. Therefore, the collaborative prioritizes those most impacted by COVID-19, while simultaneously creating a space to foster partnership and collaboration with community-based organizations, impacted businesses, cross-sector partners, healthcare entities, and public health agencies. So the collaborative is really a space to share vaccine updates and provide feedback to the State Department of Health, problem solve vaccine access barriers, plan for culturally and linguistically appropriate outreach, and really collaborate with all community partners um, with, and with others to support equitable uh, distribution of vaccine. We had over 500 individuals submit interest forms to join and participate in this collaborative and nearly 300 attended yesterday's launch. I also want to mention that we intentionally chose the word collaborative um, and, and not stand up a committee. During our community engagement process last fall, we found that there was a large interest in what we were originally planning as a vaccine implementation committee. And that led us to rethinking the structure because committees can be unintentionally limiting and can exclude interested and ideal partners simply because of the number of seats. So we, that's why we moved away from that and, and wanted to create a collaborative so that um, the space would truly allow all interested partners the option to participate. The way we're structuring these meetings is by having community relations briefings, similar to what we do with our media partners like yourselves. But this would be an opportunity for the department to actually share COVID-19 vaccine program updates and answer questions directly with the collaborative members. We recognize there are many other platforms for communities to get information, but we wanted to create one shared space where all community members could come and listen to these uh, briefings. We will also have collaborative feedback sessions where members will be invited to provide feedback on vaccine planning and outreach efforts via virtual meetings, phone conf conference calls, or email separate from these meetings. And then eventually we will probably have work groups and subcommittees uh, for, uh, for those that are more interested in taking on a more formal role. Uh, and they may join via specific topics or community specific work groups. Um, these, uh, the collaborative just launched yesterday, as I said, and it's gonna meet every first and third Wednesday. And if you need more information about the collaborative, please visit doh.wa.gov backslash vaccine collaborative. And with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Frangie. Thank you, Director Nandi. And next we'll hear from Deputy Secretary Lacey Fehrenbach. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lacey Fehrenbach, Deputy Secretary for COVID-19 Response here at DOH. I wanna start with a bit of good news. 30% of adults here in Washington, more than 1.75 million people have activated WA Notify since we launched it back uh, around November 30th. 
This number of one notify users puts Washington among the top three states for use of exposure notification technology when you look at that compared to the state's adult population. As of January 27th, Washington had the second most activations of any state. Only California is ahead of us and they have about five times as many people living there than we have here in our state. We are super proud that Washingtonians are taking this step to protect themselves and their communities. WA Notify helps people learn more quickly that they have been exposed to COVID-19 so that they can monitor their health, get tested and protect others around them. I am grateful to the third of our population that has activated WA Notify, but we need even more of you to do so. The more people who use this technology, the more effective it is. If you haven't activated WA Notify yet, please do so today. You can learn more about how it works at wanotify.org, W-A-N-O-T-I-F-Y dot O-R-G. You've heard of the three W's. You heard Dr. Shaw mention them earlier. This is Washington, so we're gonna one-up them and do have four W's. Wear a mask, wash your hands, watch your distance, and use WA Notify. I also wanna to talk to you about the Super Bowl. Usually the Super Bowl gives us a chance to root for our beloved Seahawks, but in, if not, as is the case this year, you would at least have the chance to gather with your friends or family for a fun day of football snacks and commercials. It'll look a little different this year, just like our holidays did. While we're seeing very promising signs with our data, as you heard from Dr. Shaw, um, with disease rates declining in many communities and statewide, and more and more Washingtonians getting vaccinated, now is not the time to let up our guard. With new variants, emergency, em, new variants emerging, we have got to continue our work to crush the curve of COVID-19. Just like during the holidays, we strongly recommend fewer, shorter, smaller gatherings to prevent the spread of COVID-19. This means, unfortunately, no Super Bowl parties. The safest Super Bowl party you could have is one with your own household, um, and you can link in your typical game day buddies by video or text chat. We want to acknowledge that despite our guidance on this, people may choose to gather. And if you do, please think about um, having your gathering outside as opposed to inside. Wear masks and always maintain six feet of distance. If you do end up indoors, keep your windows and doors open for good ventilation. Keep your gathering small and spread it out. Have a plan around the food. It's safest to skip your communal bowls of popcorn and other snacks and have each family or household bring their own. Do a health check beforehand and make sure nobody comes with symptoms or if they've been exposed to COVID-19 in the past two weeks. Whether it's the Super Bowl, a birthday, a baby shower, other gathering, each and every one of our individual actions makes a difference. Fewer, shorter, safer interactions are crucial. Limit the number of people outside of your household that you gather with each week in any situation, including work and school. And if you feel any symptoms of COVID-19, if you are a known close contact of someone with COVID-19, or if you receive an exposure notification through WA Notify, please get tested and otherwise stay home. With your help, we can protect the people we love, keep our COVID rates trending down, and keep saving more lives. With that, I'd like to turn it back to you, Franji. All right, thank you, Deputy Secretary Fahrenbach. This brings us to the Q&A media segment of today's briefing. We do have several media with questions today. If we're not able to get to your question, please reach out to us at doh-pio at doh.wa.gov. Our first question comes from Kelly Azar with KATU. Hi there, thank you so much for taking my question. I actually have two questions for you today. Um, I am in the area of Southwest Washington covering Southwest Washington today. And a big question we're getting from our viewers is about how many vaccines Southwest Washington is getting. They say they feel forgotten. And that's oftentimes heard down here. They say King County is getting quite a few more even though we are the second most populated area in the state. Can you explain why that is? Yeah, this is um, Michelle Roberts. There's a lot of communities that are feeling that. That is why we're working to make sure the data um, is posted to our website shortly so everybody can look at the data themselves. Every county is getting vaccines each week in our state. 
And in fact, with um, Clark County got um, some of the mass vaccination sites in addition to other community providers getting vaccine as well. The, there's been some concern about did the mass vaccination sites replace allocations to community providers, but in fact, really where the reduction has come from is the amount of vaccines that hospitals are getting. So it made sense early on, like I said, that um, when we were initially have just had a very limited group of people who were eligible for vaccines, really the workers in healthcare settings that were at highest risk, a large percentage of our vaccine went directly to hospitals, 70% or more. And like I said, that's really shifted now about 20% of our vaccine is going to hospitals and we're working to get vaccine to many other sites that we're gonna need to ensure wide access as we have more vaccines. So that includes pharmacies, clinics, local health departments, and mass vaccination sites. So, so there is vaccine going into each community. It's maybe not perfect week to week to your exact because of such limited doses and so many con, um, competing factors to your exact population percentage. But overall vaccine is in each community each week and we're gonna put that data on our website so everybody can see the information themselves. And Michelle, I have a second question. It might be for you as well. You mentioned that there, there were some clinics who were getting vaccine who weren't making that 95% mark. So you were saying the orders were going lower. That sounds concerning to a lot of us. Can those orders that might have gone to those clinics that aren't making that 95% mark go somewhere else and be used? Well, absolutely. Like I said, um, that's this is one of the ways we're helping balance the high demand. So we're not holding back vaccine for if, if we're holding it back from one provider that that vaccine is being used in our state. Last week, we had requests for over 358,000 first doses of vaccine. And like I said, we had 107,000 doses of vaccine to give out as first doses. And we gave all those doses uh, um, out. So, so when I say we're making adjustments, we're making adjustments on individual provider orders. Nobody, unfortunately, is getting everything they're asking for because there's just not enough vaccine. But the 95% requirement is one of the factors we're looking at when we make decisions on how much each individual provider makes. All right, thank you. Our next question comes from Ariel with the spokesman. Great, thank you. Um, with the shift in where the department is sending doses statewide, is there a plan to ask those vaccine distributors to become open pods to everyone and not just their own patients? And if so, when would that be? And sort of what would that look like for the general public to access? Yeah, actually most vaccine providers have been open pods the entire time. Um, so that's been kind of one of the pieces of information we've collected and also helps us choose about where to send vaccine. There's some places where it may make sense to not be an open pod. So we've got some mobile vaccine providers who are reaching adult family homes or other risk seniors, um, other senior living centers. That's an example. Also to really work for some of our providers who like community health centers and others who are making sure that there's equity taken into consideration and really an equal opportunity for all. Some of those providers um, may need to just be serving their communities that they are in where disease risk is the highest versus an open pod where, where people who are at the highest risk may be getting squeezed out. So there's a lot of pieces of that, but in generally um, most providers are serving as open pods and the ones that aren't, it's because there's considerations about the population they're serving. All right, thank you. Our next question comes from Rachel LaCourt with the Associated Press. Hi, another question or a couple of questions for Michelle. So given these challenges that people have had finding places to get a vaccine, can you give some specifics on the reasons provided um, by providers who didn't meet that 95% allocation requirement? And then also separately, why hasn't additional information been released about who's eligible in phases two through four? Why has the overall eligibility timeline been pushed back? And when will we receive more detailed information on those phases? Great question. So um, some of the challenges on the ground around meeting the 95% has just been, this is a huge um, logistical lift for providers on the ground. And before, um, up until this week, actually, we've only had a week to week allocation. And so we've not been able to provide much predictability for providers. 
And so that's made their planning on the local level really challenging. So how much vaccine are they getting? When should they have their clinics? How many people should they be offering appointments to? And that's obviously off, um, led to some of the challenges for the public and confusion about appointments and scheduling. So now that we have starting next week, three weeks of more consistent um, information from the federal government on our vaccine supply, we wanna work with the providers in our state to try to get to a more predictable pattern of vaccine for everybody so that so we can remove some of those logistical barriers. Um, remind me your second question, Rachel, it was about... So it was about, sorry, I was muted there for a second. It was about the who's eligible. Um, right. Why don't we have more information about who's eligible in those later phases? Why was the timeline pushed back to later in the summer and fall? And if you don't have that information now, when will we get that information? Yeah, I'll start at a high level and Dr. Shaw may want to add in too. Um, it's really right now we're trying to match vaccine supply to who is eligible. There are so many different groups of people who have really good reasons why they should be getting vaccined right now. There is lots of different groups who are at risk because of um, where they work or um, what types of um, kind of Co, co or underlying conditions or other risk factors may they have um, or um, who they who they live with, um, how their other family members are at risk. So we understand there's a lot of need for a lot of people to get vaccinated. We're hearing from them too. What we're trying to do is match who's eligible to who is at highest risk, how do they protect our um, capacity in the healthcare system, and how does it match um, the amount of doses we're getting. So one of the reasons we expanded the time frame out is because we did a couple of things. We did add, um, change the group of um, people who are eligible in this 1A, I mean, sorry, 1B, um, 1B tier one group, where we initially had thought the age would be 70 and older, and we bumped that down to 65, partially because um, to continue to align with the federal government and some changes they made, and also because we heard a lot from that 65 to 70 year old group who said, we're still really at high risk of death and um, we wanna be um, included. We should be included now like they're doing with the federal government. So, but adding those people in added about um, another 500,000 um, people to the group that's eligible in 1B tier one, which is a total of 1.7 million people. So we just really wanted to be realistic on the timing and match it to what was the best data we had at that time from the federal government about how much vaccine supply we have. Obviously, there's a lot of people who still need to be in line. The next groups will reach, and it's kind of called out in who may be our tier two group is reaching other types of essential workers and more people who have um, underlying conditions. Those are the next most important people to reach. And when we reach them is really gonna to need to be dependent on um, vaccine supply. Um, and that will be influenced by, are we gonna see any additional vaccines um, who will get FDA emergency use authorization over the next couple of months? And if that happens, that could really speed up the process for how quickly we get through the current groups. And then when we can add more groups um, in who are eligible. Yeah, thanks Michelle and, and Rachel, thanks for the question. I guess what I would just add is that Michelle is absolutely right that there, um, you know, there there are limitations that are not about just the state of Washington as a whole, but it's really what's happening outside of the state of Washington in terms of vaccine supply. And so it, it is um, it is difficult for a a specific timeline when we are not with um, optimal visibility on the vaccine supply chain. And uh, we, and, and again, thank, thankful to our federal partners um, in, in um, both the, you know, overall in the Biden administration, but certainly uh, is as far as uh, the CDC and the work that they have been doing uh, to really be very uh, transparent and working with states. So we're hopeful that we're gonna have continued increase in Intel on what's coming down the pike. But right now we don't have that because there still is a significant amount of uncertainty on the supply chain side from the pharmaceutical production of vaccine. And so that is why the specific timeline makes it harder for us to be able to put that out there when, when we're still uh, limited by what's happening and what's coming into the state of Washington. 
All right, our next question comes from Tom Bonzi with Public Radio. Hi, thank you. Thanks for the time. I have an interesting question about high school sports and the Department of Health's rules for COVID safety there. As you may have heard, there's uh, much happiness among tens of thousands of student athletes who are able to start their rescheduled fall sports season this week. But there's also consternation about the mandatory mask rule, particularly uh, requiring masks during maximum exertion and practice and competition. Can you talk a little bit about why it's correct and, and why uh, coaches might shouldn't be concerned about uh, students maybe in say low, low risk cross country, finishing a three mile cross country race, heaving for uh, every last breath, but having to wear a mask at that point, which inhibits catching their breath. Sure, I'm happy to start there. So the addition of um, masks in sports came in the fall um, and we added that as an extra layer of protection for our athletes. Uh, we understand that it's an adjustment to learn to do your sports or physical activity wearing a mask. However, you know, I can say anecdotally, we've heard that this is going relatively well with the athletes. Um, most of the concerns that have been expressed to us have been from parents or coaches. The athletes themselves have done pretty well uh, in adapting and adjusting to this change. Um, so uh, we recognize that people have to get used to this and also you know, part of doing more activity, especially more activity when we are seeing the disease levels that we're, we're seeing here in Washington and across the country right now requires us taking as much um, measures, as many measures as we can to keep our athletes safe and healthy. Dr. Lindquist, I don't know if you had a comment as well on, on that one. And so I just want to remind everybody, Dr. Scott Lindquist, who hasn't spoken yet, but is, is on as well to help answer some of the, the health and medical questions. Scott? Yeah, a, a couple things and then a real personal aspect to this. And, and that is, um, there's lots of studies that show that it's safe and uh, healthy to actually wear a mask. But like Lacey said, it's a real adjustment um, to the athletes to do this. But um, from a very personal note, my wife is the head cross country coach in our school district. And she has said it very well to me that if the balance is I have to have the kids all wear masks so that we can do our sport and all the value that comes from doing that sport, then it's well worth it. So, and, and like Lacey said, it's been going well. Uh, most people are able to adapt to this. And I think, you know, if this is a requirement to allow kids to get back out and exercise, even in low risk uh, groups like cross country, um, I would support it still. All right, our next question comes from Carolyn Bick with the South Seattle Emerald. Hi, yes, thank you so much for taking my uh, question. I wanted to ask, um, given the fact that the roadmap to recovery was created before the arrival of the more contagious um, and what appears to be deadlier B117 variant in the state, as well as the arrivals of um, you know the two other variants of this disease in the United States as a whole, why did uh, you and other government officials decide that loosening restrictions on regions to move into phase two and allowing two of the state um, yes, and allowing two of the state's regions to move into phase two under these less stringent guidelines, particularly since several cases of the B117 variant uh, have has been detected uh, within the countries uh, was a good idea, or uh, counties in these two regions was a good idea. I'll, I'll make a quick comment and then I'll, I'll turn it over to both Lacey and, and Dr. Lindquist on this one. Um, you know, the, this, this pandemic has been a constant balancing um, uh, throughout, um, you know, everything at the beginning, throughout the middle of the year, the end of the year in 2020, and then certainly where we are now. And every decision, you know, um, some will say you didn't go far enough. Others will say you went too far. And we are doing everything we can to balance as best we can. We do recognize that based on um, the metrics uh, that we had, uh, it, it did appear that um, we, we felt that uh, of the four metrics that allowing for three of those metrics to be met, 
uh, before you know a, a region went to phase four was the right way to go. Uh, sorry, phase two was the right way to go. But at the same time, we recognize that we have also made it very clear in in our roadmap to recovery that if we are seeing anything that that gives us pause and gives us concern, we can dial back. And uh, you know, phase phase two. Um, uh, while it, it does open up some things uh, more so than in phase one, uh, it is also a, a very uh, restrictive way of looking at things because we want to continue to be very methodical and very deliberative as we uh, open up or reopen or dial, dial, dial forward. And one of the real um, challenges that I've seen throughout the country is just the fact that oftentimes um, when, you, when you dial up very quickly, uh, or dial back very quickly, uh, there, there are uh, real challenges, not just on the operation side, but also on, on the community psyche. And we have to really be very methodical as we do this. So, you know, again, um, some will say not far enough, some will say too far. We think it's, the, it's, a, it's a good balance, but we are very concerned about the variants and, and watching these very carefully and very closely. And if there is any concern uh, in our minds that things are not going in the right direction, then, then certainly that's the reason that we've, we have that additional um, uh, means of being able to dial back our regions. Um, and with that, let me, let me ask if Lacey or, or Scott, if you had any additional comments, especially around the, around the variants. Yeah, I'll, I'll start, Lacey, and then add in anything. So there hasn't been a night that I haven't gone to bed thinking about the variant. And then the first thing in the morning, the first thing I think about is the variant. So one of the things I'm really proud of in Washington is we're stepping up our game to do surveillance for these variants. And it's not just the UK variant or the South African variant. Um, this virus is mutating. So we are doing a very aggressive job of looking for any variants. So our goal at this point is to have 5% of all our positive uh, COVID-19 tests uh, actually get sequenced to find out if it's a variant or otherwise. We also have a very aggressive uh, process in the state now. If a lab does a specific test that is an indicator of it could be this variant, we are genotyping those in real time. Um, so we'll have a, a much better pre prevalence of um, this variant or other variants as we go forward. Our public health lab has also um, entered the game of doing genotyping and uh, within the next two weeks, we'll be up and running doing genotyping in addition to our academic colleagues at the University of Washington that are doing a lot of this testing for us. So like Dr. Shaw said, I think with our stepped up um, surveillance for these isolates, if we see anything alarming, we will be able to um, change course. We are not seeing that yet. Just a reminder, we have only uh, detected five of the UK variants. None of the other variants have been detected here in Washington state. Um, I'll just really quickly add, you know, Dr. Shaw said we really are trying to create stability when, when communities move. I do want to call out that the criteria to stay in phase two are also fairly strict. Communities have to continue meeting three of four metrics. So if we see an increase in cases or an increase in hospitalizations um, and that community doesn't meet another metric or they don't meet those two, uh, that they would be moved back. And so if there's a more contagious or transmissible variant circulating, it's very likely that they would start seeing an increase in cases at least. Um, and you know, potentially if they're not meeting one of the other three remaining metrics, they would be at risk for moving back. So um, we're trying to build a bi-directional responsive uh, system here and also balance all of those things that Dr. Shaw mentioned. I, you know, we are here on this uh, briefing today because of COVID. There are other public health impacts of a closed economy that we're weighing as well. Thank you. Our next question comes from Sam Spitz with KEPR. 
Hi, thank you so much for taking my question. Um, so last week, a report showed that the Benton County Mass uh, Fairgrounds vaccination site vaccinating the most people out of all the mass vaccination clinics in Washington. I talked to some officials at the site and they'll say they will have vaccinated more than 6,000 people after today with the whole process taking less than 45 minutes. And, and just yesterday we were talking to them and they were saying there were no lines in the morning and we're urging people to with appointments to come early. So kind of seeing this efficiency, what are the chances of getting more vaccine delivered to the site or increasing that percentage allocated so they can offer more appointments? I'll make a quick comment and then I'll turn it to Michelle and, or, or Lacey on this one. And what I would just say is that one, uh, just recognize that whenever we move vaccine from one, you know, one either geographically from one place to another or sector, or even by individual a provider, um, um, invariably because we have limited supply and as Michelle very eloquently pointed out with the 100 um, or so thousand uh, first dose uh, vaccines that are, um, you know, that are uh, coming into the state on a, on a weekly basis and, and really 358,000 uh, vaccines that are being requested um, so, you know, the math doesn't work. We, we don't have enough vaccine. So, so when, we, when we pull from somewhere to go somewhere else, invariably we are taking from somewhere. Um, we're doing everything we can to make sure that we have mass vaccination efforts up and, and ready and the capacity built because you can, from a, a modular standpoint, you can add to that capacity as you get more vaccine and, and it allows you to be able to to, to, to build faster. But the, the reason that Podge and what he said earlier is so critical that while we're also recognizing the importance of, 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 of throughput and numbers and, and the, the amount of vaccine that's delivered in any one site, we're also recognizing the importance of, of equity and making sure that we have a geographic or community um, um, vaccine um, in communities across the, the state that allow us to really balance equity while we're also achieving throughput. So it's a, it's a it, just as I'm laying that out, it sounds complicated. It may sound very simple, it is not, it's complicated. And it's a very compressed timeline to, to make decisions and to be able to, to, to do things that, that are allowing us to pivot from earlier strategies, again, with the plan in place, earlier strategies to where we're going because we wanna make sure that we're balancing both the, the numbers as well as the, the uh, equity considerations. Um, so I just wanna point out that, you know, if you, if you point at any one site, you can always say, well, gosh, if we just did X here, you'd be able to add, but again, it's, it's taking away from somewhere else and we have to really be very thoughtful in how we go about doing that. So Michelle, I don't know if you wanted to add something or Lacey to that, or Podge. I just wanted to say one quick thing. I'm um, glad you raised uh, the concern about equity, Dr. Shah. I think there are equity considerations even in the max vac sites, which we're taking into account because we need to make sure that these vaccination, the larger vaccination sites, while limited, are still accessible for all individuals, especially our BIPOC community members and individuals with disabilities. So we're working very hard behind the scenes. We know that it, it was a quick rollout and equity is in the details. So we have to make sure that we can actually make sure that it is truly accessible. So we're uh, working on some very specific uh, tactical uh, action items to make sure that we're meeting those accessibility standards, we're meeting uh, linguistic and interpretation services standards um, so that all individuals in Washington can access those sites uh, equitably. Um, we also have to be mindful of um, that there are some other barriers like transportation barriers and things like that. So this is again, as Dr. Shah said, just one aspect it's a multimodal aspect and as vaccine supply increases, we will have better opportunities, more equitable opportunities and more community rooted opportunities to uh, disp dispense vaccine. If, if I could just make one, one other comment, um, since Paj so nicely said this, I, I would say that uh, states across the country and, and speaking to colleagues across the country, everybody is, is challenged by the same proposition, which is how to balance uh, both uh, numbers and throughput with equity considerations. I am very proud of how Department of Health with our partners, our stakeholders, 
under Governor Inslee's leadership that we are balancing with two very complementary aspects of vaccine administration. One is the VAX, the Vaccine Action Command and Control System Center, the ACCS, and the other is the, the collaborative, the Vaccine Implementation Collaborative that is really about feedback dialogue. And, and really, uh, equity is, is central to both of them, but certainly that we are, we are championing equity in, in the, in the uh, collaborative discussions because that is absolutely critical. We wanna be complementary and we wanna balance both because yes, we, we wanna get vaccine out to as many people as possible, as quickly as possible, but we wanna make sure that, that all communities can, can share in that, in, you know, in the ability of getting protected from this incredible precious resource that we have. And it is a, a, an incredible gift that we have that we are uh, with vaccine that a year ago, I think a lot of us were thinking, gosh, when is this going to happen? And the reality is that we have it in front of us. We, we do need more supply. We do need more, you know, more um, um, support from our federal partners. That said, uh, we can't do it alone. And so really having partners throughout on both sides of the spectrum is absolutely critical to the work that we're doing. And I, and I, I want to give a shout out to our Department of Health team. I mean, this is also a very difficult lift. Uh, they have been working day and night, weekends, I mean, holidays 24-7 to, to make sure that we are achieving the optimal balance as best we can under very arduous and difficult circumstances. That said, it has been a year of this and the vaccine is just the latest iteration of what we are achieving at the Department of Health and with our partners. And so I just wanna say thank you to the Department of Health team and staff, but also absolute thank you to our local health partners, our healthcare partners, pharmacies, you know, community health centers, uh, those that are helping us with mass vaccination sites, our, our private sector colleagues, and most importantly, to our community members who have really been uh, while it may, you know, may look at times that that people are not patient, absolutely, we are so appreciative of the patience that our community members have 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 shown, especially as they see, you know, certain people uh, because of age or because of risk or because they're a healthcare worker uh, be able to get vaccinated while they're waiting patiently. Uh, and we want to make sure the message is don't hesitate, vaccinate uh, to our providers and also to our uh, community members um, don't hesitate, get vaccinated, right? Uh, we want to make sure that message is uh, when when it's time for, for that queue to open up for you, please do everything you can to encourage vaccination across your communities, uh, your neighbors, your family members, and certainly making sure that we can do that in an equitable way is absolutely critical to our success. All right, we have time for one more quick question from Sandy at the Seattle Times. Sorry about that. I didn't realize I was muted. Uh, thanks. Thanks for taking the question. Um, I'm hearing a lot of anxiety and worry from people who have not been able to schedule their second doses of the vaccine. So I'm wondering, what are you doing to ensure that those doses will be there? And is it appropriate for vaccine providers to turn away people who didn't get the first dose with that provider when they come in search of a second dose? Well, let me let me answer a quick, uh, uh, on your second question, I'll, I'll give a quick answer and then I'll turn it over to Michelle uh, for the for additional comments. Um, you know, our, our, our goal is, and we would encourage community members where they have been vaccinated for the first dose to go back to that same provider. We know that's not always possible, but that is the encouragement that we want to give to our community members to go back for a number of reasons. You can imagine just because you have consistency and you have the ability to, to, to follow up with the provider, to track, to all, do all sorts of things, that would help us tremendously. But we also recognize that that's not always possible. And so that's where the individual part, partner on the ground, the, the actual provider of vaccine comes in. So let me just make that quick comment and then I'll turn it over to Michelle. 
Yeah, we're working right now to figure out some uh, some of these difficulties and working with providers to make sure the second doses are really um, available and in the right places. It is our commitment to make sure everybody who gets vaccinated gets a second dose. That's really um, what we know is the best scientific evidence for um, protection from um, from COVID with the vaccines is getting both doses. The ideal time framing is either two or three weeks later, depending on the vaccine you're getting, but that could be, I mean, sorry, three or four weeks later, depending on the vaccine you're getting. And that could be um, up to maybe an additional two weeks if you, if you need time to find the right place to get vaccinated. So we are looking at the amount of second dose needs, second doses in our state needed. There was some confusion among providers over the last couple of weeks. And unfortunately we did have some second doses used as first doses, which was kind of creating a crunch for second doses right now. We're looking about very quickly, how do we sort this out and um, how do we ensure that the second doses are there? And like Dr. Shaw said, we're really encouraging people and encouraging providers to schedule first dose appointments when they're, I mean, second dose appointments when they're giving that first dose of vaccine. That's really critical. And then we're also um, encouraging um, them to accommodate people who do need to move providers because um, you may be getting vaccine at a different clinic or you may be coming in and out of the state. And we want to make sure everybody has access to their second dose of vaccine. So we're working with providers on strategies on how to manage. All right, this concludes the question and answer segment of our briefing today. And now we'll go to Secretary Shaw for closing remarks. I wanna thank uh, my colleagues for, um, for providing such hopefully useful information, important information. I wanna thank all of you, our media partners for, for everything you can do to help elevate this information to our community members uh, during this very continued difficult time in our state. And I wanna most of all thank our, our partners and community members for everything they have continued to do to help support all the activities that are happening across the state. I'm, I'm very uh, proud of uh, this, this, this notion of collaboration and both in terms of getting vaccines out quickly, but also to get vaccines out equitably. And I really wanna underscore the importance of that. Uh, it was brought up that Super Bowl is coming this weekend, and we know that the Seahawks didn't make it this year. Um, but we do not want to lose the Super Bowl because we let our guard down with respect to what we need to do to champion prevention in our own homes and our own families. And so I just want to say thank you to all of you in advance for taking those preventive steps. Uh, it is going to be absolutely critical. We do not want to see another surge two weeks from Super Bowl Sunday because we had people who were not doing the three W's and not uh, avoiding those gatherings and ultimately getting sick and or exposing others. Please help us. We want to do everything we can to enjoy um, the, the weekends and the weekdays and all the efforts that all of us are putting in but to do that in a way that does not cause more harm to our community. So with that, thank you so much. Thank you to my colleagues. And I really wanna say thank you to, to everybody. And uh, Frangie, we'll turn it back to you to close us out. All right, thank you. Well, this concludes today's media availability. I'd like to thank our panelists for their time today. 